Hello, welcome. My name's Gary Riggs. I'm the Interpretive Programs Coordinator for Tryon Palace. Today, we're going to do a video about soldier's life. As you see, we've uh, gathered our firewood, got a fire started. And while we were getting the fire started, my part was busy getting the ration together. What we have here in the pot is dry peas better known as black-eyed peas. And we've got some salt pork cut up in it. We were able to get an onion from a local plantation. So we're gonna have a little bit of black-eyed peas with some salt pork and ham. It's gonna be really tasty. And also, while the fire's going, we're gonna take the fire and let it bake down into coals and hot ash. One of the things we're gonna show you today is how soldiers would take flour that was issued to them and bake it down into bread something called ash cakes. You could do the same thing with the cornmeal ration too. But until that time happens and this uh, fire bakes down, we're going to go over and I'm going to explain to you the contents of a Union soldier's knapsack. So, follow me. Now, as you see on the ground here, there's a lot of stuff that a soldier would carry. Some soldiers would carry more, some would carry less. But since this is a video series of educational uh, value, I'm showing you some things that soldiers typically would have. Also, I am also representing a soldier from the 1st North Carolina Union Volunteers that was raised here in North Carolina, troops that was loyal to the Union. So, we already know basically the area where we're stationed at, where we're fighting. But to get to the equipment, we're going to start over here. This black bag contains the soldiers' rations, and I have an assortment of rations. I have rations that was issued daily. Rations would consist of a meat component, which could be salt pork, smoked pork, salt beef, fresh beef, whatever they could forge. Also, a bread component. That bread component would be flour, cornmeal, and or hardtack. Hardtack was mostly issued out when soldiers was on campaign, what we're portraying today. But we're actually going to take the flour that we have, one pound of flour, six ounces, and we're going to bake that up into some bread right there in the ash. Also, cornmeal. Got one pound, four ounces of cornmeal. Now, cornmeal of the time wasn't like that of the day. Today's cornmeal is a very fine, fine grind. Cornmeal at that time was a very rough grind. It was almost like uh, the consistency of grits is, very big. And how to prepare cornmeal, you would actually have <coughs> boiling water, and you would pour it into the bowl, and you would actually start the cooking process then. To bake cornbread like this, you could blot it out into a thin patty. You could bake it as we're going to do the ash cakes, or you could do it on a board, leaned up against the fire. Soldiers also had to have water. Now, most of the streams and water contain parasites, bacteria. That's how a lot of the soldiers got dysentery. And there was really no way of actually cleaning the water because at that time they didn't know anything about boiling the water and keeping it pure so you know a lot of soldiers would drink coffee boiling the water would kill the parasites that way coffee was a lot safer now we have two different items here one is a thin sheet iron or tin frying pan with a riveted handle on it soldiers would, would somehow or another either buy these from a sutler or find them or barter but a lot of soldiers would take a canteen that was leaking. Canteens were made out of tin. They were sorted together. They would take it, throw it into an existing campfire, and the sorter would melt, therefore separate the canteen and the spout. The part that did not have a hole in it, they would save, put a piece of wire where the spout was and punching two holes in it, taking a green sapling, putting it in, and now you have a frying pan. When you get finished, take the stick out. If you want to carry it with you, you can. You can toss it. You can just tie this onto your knapsack or anywhere and carry it with you. 
Same thing with this. You could tie this on on the outside of your knapsack. Cups. Ten cups. Some were bigger, some were smaller. Some things uh, were about the size, maybe two or three inches taller with a lid. They were called muckets. They could use them as a small boiling pot, coffee pot, whatever they wanted to do. They could also eat out of it if they wished. Now, as we move down, you see this satchel here. This is a double bag 1858 model Union knapsack. Regulations called for a army blanket, gray wool army blanket, a shelter half, which is half of a tent. Two men would get together, button their halves together, and there you would have a shelter half for staying overnight. Did not have a front and a back, it was low to the ground. This was put here. You were issued a ground cloth and a poncho. Notice ponchos, I've got this folded inside. So as it was raining, I folded it up. I didn't want everything here to get wet. So the wet part is actually folded onto itself. It is placed on here and everything is fastened together. Now, all this stuff is actually laying on a tarred ground cloth. Same thing the poncho is made out of and the haversack. Soldiers would lay this out, lay on to keep the moisture from going up and uh, seeping into their clothes. The two mats that I have, the poncho and the ground cloth, are somewhat weighty. A lot of soldiers would take the ground cloth, throw it away, and use the poncho because it's got a slit in it to put over your neck. But also, when you put it on the ground, that slit is covered by a thin piece of tarred material so you could actually double it, use one thing for two purposes. We have a sewing kit. Uniform got ripped or something, you had to make sure you know how to sew so you can sew it. Extra pair of socks, a pair of flannel underwear, maybe an extra shirt. All the personal items would be kept up here in this bag. And you would strap it together and down the road you would go. Some soldiers preferred to take even less than this. They would take their contents, roll it up in their blanket, tie the ends of it, sling it across their shoulder, and carry it. It's a lot less stuff to carry, but however, some soldiers preferred one or the other. Now, some of the other contents in it that would be a personal effect, of course, I have matches. I have a shaving kit, mirror, shaving brush, soap, a straight razor and a cardboard uh, straight razor holder to help protect it. Believe it or not, toilet paper was around. This is a reproduction copy of an original label. It's called Personal Sheets. And of course, you have the Bible. Cartridge box. This is what the Union soldier and Confederate soldier would actually keep their ammunition in. As you can see, I have 40 rounds, 20 in top, 20 in the bottom. This pouch here is actually the toolbox. And in it, I have Springfield nipple wrench, screwdrivers for taking the, the mus rifle musket apart. I also have something called a wiper and I have something called a worm. The worm is what you would retrieve the bullet out of the barrel with if the musket did not go off because of faulty powder. A belt, waist belt, cap box. It's got little brass caps in it to go on the cone of the musket. Bayonet scabbard, which your bayonet fit into. You take notice to the two hats. When you first saw on the first part of this video, I had the black hat on with the blue hat cord. That is actually one of the things that soldiers both north and south really, really acquired and really took care of because that hat, of course, would help you with the sun. It would keep the sun out of your eyes somewhat. It would help shed rain, help the sun from burning your neck. You could use it as a, as a, uh, a little bucket to get water with, whatever you needed to. 
The cappy over there, the blue hat with a bugle on it, is a standard issued infantry cappy. It's just there. The only thing you get protection is maybe sun right directly on top of your head and a little bit of visor there, but it doesn't really help much keeping sun out of your eyes. Fire's baking down some coals. While that's doing that, I may have to add a little bit more wood to it. Also, our flour ration. We're going to make us some ash cakes. I've added just plain water, maybe a little bit of salt if we were had it. I could use a spoon but I'm just going to use this twig right here to make a, a stiff dough to get it all mixed up and I'm going to show you some ways to do it. One is going to be in the ashes. Another one is going to be using the ramrod of the musket. Now being soldiers on bivouac, you got to use your hands. Heat kills germs. So, we take this, we got to make it into a dough. I've got enough water, but I need to add a little bit more flour because it's still a little bit damp. So, I'll take our flour ration, put just a little bit more in it. and we start to mix again. I have enough flour here to make several bread items. And I just got to get it to the right consistency. And I know y'all are probably wondering, well, how's he gonna clean these dishes? Just like they did back then. Scrape out what you can, maybe have some sand run around in it, or since we're in a little wood of the area while we were scoping and camping things out, there's a stream right down there in the hollow. We're gonna go down there and we're gonna actually rinse our uh, utensils out. So, just got to knead this bread good. Throw some more wood up there. It's not quite got enough ashes on there yet. We're just going to let her bake down some more. Now, if soldiers were in a more stationary camp or if they were in an area and they were going to stay there two, three, four days, obviously you'd have a commissary wagon with them and you'd have an army cook. And of course, in fort settings and garrisons, obviously soldiers wouldn't do this. They were fed three times a day. In the previous clip, when I was talking about the rations, rations was issued once daily. So whatever you had left over in food, you didn't throw it away. If you weren't that hungry or you, you saved, especially your meat and your grease out of your meat ration. So you can see this is pretty well kneaded up. Still a little bit damp, so I'm gonna use the remaining flour that's in the bowl to get it to a real stiff dough. You can see our uh, beans is boiling pretty good in there. I checked it for water, it's doing real good. Maybe rake some of the fire off directly off of it. Get a little bit more flour here. attempt to make two different types of bread ration. So 
for the nail. I'm gonna reach over here and I'm gonna get my ramrod out of my rifle. Soldiers always carried a some type of a rag or a huck towel with them to handle the hot pots. So I'm just cleaning off this ramrod right here. And we're gonna take this piece of dough. I'm gonna roll it out into a long snake. Got to make it thin enough. Boy, them peas are smelling. Smelling good. Because the thinner it is, the better it's going to cook up. See? So now, you take this, stick it right there in the ground. Can't get it just so close because you don't want to burn it, but you got to keep rotating it. Check on the beans. Coming along pretty nicely. Yeah. It's back on the fire. Let this cook down into some more ash. Such a hot ember there. And the nail. Make it kind of thin, thin ish. And I'm going to go get my uh, PNC hat over here. And I'm actually going to use this to get some coals out here from one fire and put them on the other. Now, the fire is still a little bit too hot actually put it on there right now but you don't put it on red hot coals you put it on hot ash and to turn your bread you just simply come here and rotate we're gonna show you how to cook a fire cake just right there in the coals so it should take anywhere from 10 to 12 minutes so See how it's going to turn out. You lay it right on the coals or the hot ash. Then you take hot ash nearby and you just start covering it up. Careful and try not to get any dirt in it.
because a little bit of this ash, if you didn't have nothing, it would actually be able to help with any digestive problems that you may have. It's not really going to hurt you. We actually took some of this flour and we uh, baked it on the ramrod of the musket too. So in about 10 or 12 minutes, give or take, we should have a, a nice piece of biscuit come out. The results of our ash cake that you saw us cooking in a previous video, we're just taking it out of the ashes and you can see it's got a little charred spots around the edges, but that's normal. But it baked up pretty good. Nice and tender inside, not doughy. Takes anywhere from about five, six to eight minutes, depending on how thick you make your, your dough before you put it in. You just blow the ashes off, and it's time to eat. Now, a little bit of ash is good to help for the digestive system. If you've got an upset stomach, a little bit of ash is good for it. Good. Good. We'll go over a quick manual of arms. This is ways that the soldiers would carry their weapon on the march to help ease or rest one arm or the other. This position, standing in line at attention, is order arms. Shoulder arms is this. Grasping the trigger guard by the index finger and the thumb, you can carry this weapon for quite some ways. This weapon weighs about 13 pounds, give or take. Another command would be right shoulder shift, arms. They would carry it like this on the whole march. Also, if they were marching and they were given the order to double quick by files left or right into line march, they would automatically come to this position because in this position, you could actually uh, pick up your pace in marching or actually run with this weapon a whole lot better than any other position. From here, one of the other positions would be support arms. Putting the hammer in the bend of the elbow, you could walk controlling it if you're in rocky or rough terrain and as you're moving the weapon's doing this. You could also control it like this. But also in this position, if I was given the command rest at a stop, I'll grab and just rest. Attention. And then if it's rainy or inclement weather, one of the commands would be secure arms. You just invert the musket, putting the lock under your arm, your thumb on the ramrod pipe, to make sure that the ramrod is not going to slide out, and you can march until you were able to get camp set up. Shoulder arms. Order arms. In place, rest. Thank you. I'm going to show you the loading firing process. This time we'll be firing a blank round. Oh. How you do it welcome back this video is going to be about winter quarters during the american civil war when winter time was approaching both armies would go into encampments called winter quarters now there were several different type of buildings one type is all log construction because logs of course is in a wooded area and that's where they camped at so they chopped them down and made small log cabins for the men and a log cabin, probably a 12 by 12, would have anywhere from six to eight men. It was very crowded. They had makeshift fireplaces made out of mud sticks. Sometimes they used stones if they were available. Also, winter quarters could have been built out of sawn lumber. If the encampment or the regiment was encamped next to a, a populated area or a little suburb that had a sawmill, the army would actually pay 
to have boards cut and troops would build winter quarters. Winter quarters could be encased as this one, which is all sawn with a wooden roof, shingles. Sometimes they would just have the full wooden walls and they would take the tents and the flies that they had and they would drape over that. And that would actually help shed the water as long as you didn't touch the canvas. Now these winter quarters, this one here does not have a fireplace in it. Sometimes uh, little uh, heaters, probably about a foot square and about a foot and a half long, uh, sometimes would be used by officers and the men, that's how they would be able to stay warm. And also rations at the time. Food, of course, you're in winter quarters. You're gonna to have to eat what was available, what you could forage. You're not gonna to get too many fresh fruits and vegetables during this time. So if you have uh, any interest in becoming part of a living history organization, then I would suggest that you would do the research and when you do it, do it historically correct. Thank you. Welcome back. As you can see, we've got a little bit of salt pork that we are cooking up here. And it's pretty well done. And I'm going to put it right here on the plate. And I'm going to turn and I've got some potatoes already cut up that I'm actually going to put in here. Break all them in there. And one thing, we got some of the uh, juices left over from the salt pork, but I need to add a little bit of water to this to keep uh, the potatoes from sticking so bad and also to help create a little bit of steam so they'll go ahead and start cooking. So I'm going to get my canteen and I'll be right back. Notice the fire is not a roaring fire, it's basically just coals. And that's the ideal fire that you want to cook with. That way you can control your heat, you won't be so susceptible in, in uh, burning your food. Set it right here. And while they are cooking, some of the ways soldiers would make coffee. A lot of soldiers would take their coffee ration if the coffee was issued already roasted. If not, they would have to roast it. They would take a bayonet or a stick and they would have to take and grind their coffee like this. Once they got the coffee ground, they would pour it in a small vessel and hold it and then they would fill their cup up with water, set it on the fire, and let it come to a boil. Once it come to a boil, they would take the grains of coffee that they had ground up, pour it into hot water, let it sit anywhere from eight to 10 minutes. Take probably a couple of teaspoons of cold water out of your canteen, pour it in. The cold water will help the grains settle to the bottom. They would put sugar in it if they wanted sugar. If not, they would drink it and uh, their teeth would actually filter the grains out and they'd throw the rest of it away. Or some soldiers would take their housewives and they would actually make a bag to actually put the coffee grains in. And that's what I'm gonna do here today. I'm gonna put the coffee grains in here, like so. And I'm going to tie it up. Now, what I would do, I've got this, I'm going to take a piece of firewood and just beat it against the tree here while I'm keeping my eye on the potatoes over there. And this is working along pretty good.
This sit dish right here by the fire. And just let this water heat up a little bit. And if the handle gets a little bit hot, Stir these up, make sure they're getting cooked all the way around. Put it back over. Also, if you need to add a little fire that's close to the cup, you could always brush some of the coals up against it. things up so quick. Another trick, I can take that water that's producing the steam here and put my plate over it like that. Kind of help keep some of that steam in there to help cook the potatoes. Put my canteen over here and it's just a uh, waiting cook. We figure we give you a, a little midway point right here, seeing what we're doing. We've already cooked the ham, and we actually added the ham back into the potatoes to help actually put some salt into the potatoes. And it's probably needing about, I say, 10, 12 more minutes, and this will be done. And also the coffee right here will be done too. Here's the finished product. Our salt ham and potatoes. Our coffee right here is almost ready. I'm going to show you the finished product. This looks like it is going to be really good. Mm. Very good, very good. Sure hits the spot after a long day's march. Hope that you uh, find this very interesting, educational, and uh, Make sure to look at all the previous videos that we've done. Thank you.